Hello, I'm Mark. Welcome to Nate Sutan. It's now the beginning of the spring rotation here at Nutmeg TV, and uh, we've started with another cycle for um, for early March. So happy spring, everyone! I hope you've been. Uh, Joining me in the exploration of the Gnostic Gospels uh, that, since we've been uh, opened it up a, a couple of months ago, and slowly but surely been working our way through it. I'm going to continue today in the Gnostic Gospels, in the Valentinian Gnostic Gospels, in the Gospel of Philip, and I'm going to finish the Gospel of Philip up today and and and, and move on to the next sections. Um, and uh, I hope that, uh, as I said, the viewer at home, you at home, has been following it. Uh, because I know it's kind of uh, disconcerting to uh, come to a show where I'm talking about something that's like midstream, but but in any case, it's a brief overview because it's been a, a three-week uh, uh, vacation we had, a hiatus that we had from uh, coming to uh, taping for the show. Just as an overview, uh, the Gospel of Philip is uh, one of the Gnostic Gospels uh, that falls under the branch of Valentinian Gnosticism. And this was those that followed the Christian Gnostic Valentinos. Now, Valentinos was around, um, as I believe it was like 135 AD, and uh, there was a student of his name, uh, Ptolemy, that took over. There's another section right after this by one of his students called, uh, by, by one of his students, Ptolemy, a letter to, uh, to a, woman, a female Christian. And I partially bring this up to, uh, of course, to bring a, a viewer at home up to speed about exactly what the reference point is when I'm talking about the Gnostic Gospels, because I had done some research um, into what is uh, expressed and talked about when it comes to Gnosticism. And some of the videos that I've come across, you know, particularly when I was on YouTube, we used that as my main vehicle for the exploration. And um, for the most part, largely most of the videos that I've come across that talk about the Gnostic Gospels, the Gnostic Bible, the Gnostic teachings, give a very rudimentary um, explanation of, and kind of like using umbrella terms, as I said, with the Gnostic Gospels, there are, are, are different Gnostic sects. They have variations in the story, though a lot of the stories are the same, whether it is Sethian Gnostics or where we are now with the Valentinian Gnostics, and you've got the Syrian Gnostics, and then there's uh, the uh, Manidaeans or the Manicheans. And the reason why this is significant to point out is because in some ways, uh, in some of the videos that I've seen, it seems almost somewhat dismissive about Gnosticism. Now, I know that um, there may be agenda. Those that produce some of these videos may actually be of a uh, uh, particular denomination that um, would discredit the, the Gnostics saying that they, that they came later. Um, none of the people that that uh, wrote these Gnostic Gospels, they don't know who the authors are. Um, the, the, one of the videos I had seen, uh, the person that produced it said that uh, in the Gnostic Gospels, the particular ones that he had talked about, and he didn't make any distinction between Sethian or Valentinian, and he said that it was like the fourth century, uh, that they were dated back to the fourth century, which to some degrees is a little dishonest because, as I said, Valentinos, now if you start to do the math on this, Valentinos was a Roman Christian at around 135, 140 AD. And he was involved with, and now I read the, uh, the prelude at the beginning of the chapter on Valentinian, or the Valentinian uh, Gnostics, and they were very involved with the Orthodox Church. Uh, they, were, uh, they were considered members of the Orthodox Church and uh, but they had variations on um, their teachings that caused the schisms that caused them to kind of fall away. Uh, you know, particularly some of the things that I've been over and some of the things I'm going to go over again today. But the reason why I bring it up is because for those who seem to seek to discredit uh, some of the Gnostic teachings as older than the original four Gospels of the New Testament or because they don't know who the, who the authors are, um, it's not necessarily true what they're saying. It's more, and, and I hesitate, hesitate to use the word smear campaign, but a discrediting of sorts of, of the validity of the, the Gnostic perspective. And um, I think it's interesting because the Gnostics, as I said, if Valentinos was a, was a, a, a Gnostic and he started his movement around 135, that is really only roughly around 45 years after the last gospel was written, 
or the, the Gospel of John, because as we've been over before, when you when you trace the timeline, the Gospel of Mark was first, and then you have the uh, Gospel of Mark and Luke. I'm sorry, Matthew and Luke, who have said to have borrowed heavily from the Gospel of Mark, and then you've got the apocryphal uh, Johannian um, Gospel, and um, so Mark was around 65 to 70 A.D. Matthew and Luke was around 70 to 80 A.D. And John was written around somewhere in the, in the 90s, like 90 to 100 A.D. Um, Valentinos himself as a person. Now, the reason why this is significant is because Valentinos was, um, the, the, you know, the plain truth is, and as I've said before on the, sh on the show, the four Gospels of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, even though they're credited, credited to those particular persons of the character of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, they don't know who, no, the scholars do not know, and this is known universally within Christian history that, uh, unless of course it's argued by a Christian apologist, that the, that the true authors of those Gospels aren't known. Um, and uh, in comparison to uh, Valentinos, who he had met Christ, of course, but he had a particular take with his Gnosticism, uh, an interpretation of what, the root of what Jesus was teaching. And it was within a lifetime of the last or the, the, the latest Gospel of John. Then I just think that that's interesting that they can't necessarily be discredited out of hand by saying things like, oh, well, they're as old as the third or fourth century because that's actually not true. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas uh, actually put, uh, Barnstone and Myers state clearly in this book that the, or some of the earliest Gospels of Thomas were written around 50 AD, which is roughly 15 years before the, the Gospel of Mark. But Thomas, of course, was discredited as considered a Gnostic Gospel, then it's been discredited as to be canonized into the New Testament. And the reason why I bring this up is because, you know, when you're doing research and you're, you're trying to get a feel for what maybe consensus might be for Gnosticism and the Gnostic Bible, I find that there's very degrees of, of disinformation when it comes to exactly what the root of the Gnostic Gospels is teaching. And I wanted to go over that a little bit again before I finish up uh, with uh, the, the, the last parts of uh, the Gospel of Philip. Now, at the last show, I had made a point of saying that uh, what some teachings sound like to the Gnostic ear. And what I mean is, in particular, specifically, the teachings of Jesus. And I actually had gone to lengths because uh, the authors of this book also, when they were, would write particular, for example, um, when they would, um, one of the sections I'm going to be going over today, it talks about um, hidden parts are upright. And one section of it, it has the line, even now the axe lies set against the roots of the tree. And uh, the footnote 84, it's from Matthew 3.10. The Gnostic Gospels um, have Jesus as the centerpiece of their belief system. But being the centerpiece of their belief system, they've got a radically different understanding of the root of why he was here. And um, just trying to keep everything, like I said, in, in, inside of a, of a ballpark so I don't get too far afield. If you've got two competing factions for interpretation, and w of course we know which one won this competition of the orthodoxy that we have now, and everything that goes along with the orthodoxy that goes along now. Jesus is Son of God. Jesus is, is Savior that died for our sins. All these different aspects that go along with what is very familiar to all of us within the Judeo-Christian ethic and world that we live, contrasting in some ways glaringly against what the Gnostic heard and what Jesus was saying. And it's expressed in their writing. And as I, and another uh, term that I used in the last show was uh, uh, continuity. <clears throat> the Gnostics wove an understanding out of what Jesus said. And it was expressed in their writings, whether it was in the Sethian or it was in the, the Valentinians. And it's not that I want to, to beat a dead horse or I want to make this too dry or academic. But the point is, again, because they had such radically different understandings of the root of what Jesus was trying to teach or the idea that he was trying to relay, um, they had dramatically different workings 
for getting to that end goal. So it would explain contextually why the Gnostics wrote as they did, and they encouraged and they admonished as they did, because they had a decidedly different um, step-by-step process for getting to the end goal in comparison to the orthodoxy and their step-by-step process to get to the end goal. So moving forward with that idea, and what separates these two in, a, in, a, in, in a, just as an oversimplification, um, for the Gnostics, first and foremost, the process that Jesus was talking about was internalized. Everything that the Gnostic, at least like say for instance the Valentino, and I can't speak for, there's varying degrees of agreement with like say for instance the Sethians and the Valentinians and some of the, the Syrian Gnostics, but some points I think were universally accepted or or at least by the majority. And one was, the very first one, the process is internalized. The Gnostics came to believe and came to hear that whatever Jesus was talking about, he was t- when he whether he talked about the bridal chamber or he talked about going into the holiest of holies or uh, the narrow gate or um, uh, the the, the uh, it's easier for a, a rich a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to go to heaven. Whatever Jesus said pointed in the direction of an internalization of a process to try and become aware or try to wake up. That idea is predicated on the fact that you can not they shoot on, you can heal yourself, physician heal yourself. That does run in glaring contrast to the idea, the orthodox idea that we're born inherently flawed. And if you're born inherently flawed, there's really nothing you can do to get to heaven save ex- accepting the blood of Jesus Christ as your savior and that act of grace will get you to heaven. So there's the first clear distinction of what the Gnostics, or at least in, in how I'm explaining how I've come to feel about it, how the Gnostics thought the, the root of what Jesus was teaching was in comparison to the orthodoxy. Second, Gnosticism, or Gnosis, this knowing, to the Gnostic did a couple of different things. It woke them up, it healed them, and it rebalanced them. Now, um, as I may have mentioned or touched upon in the, in the, in, in the last show, and I ran, kind of ran out of time, and, and perhaps you know, uh, there's confirmation bias, as it were, in, inside of myself as a presenter in some of the things that I've studied. I had done a show and I presented Kabbalah and uh, you know Jewish mysticism, and um, perhaps it's reading into it, but perhaps there actually is something to it. There seems to be some interesting Kabbalistic parallels in the Gnostic understanding of what Jesus is teaching, if not um, direct Kabbalistic connections to what Jesus is talking about, at least as far as the Gnostic understanding or how the Gnostic ear heard it. The reason why I say it is because this idea of of healing or awaking or, or, or rebalancing the Gnostics seem to believe that Jesus was saying that, you know, because we judge as we do, that he is without sin, cast the first stone, and, and uh, people that are possessed by demons and all these different things could represent a person out of balance, a person who, having this Kabbalistic tree inside of them, uh, a sense of fairness and justice and uh, mercy and grace in comparison to judgment and severity, needs to balance themselves. And the only way to balance oneself and come awake was by seeking out and absorbing Gnosis. To the Gnostics, this was the main thrust of what they thought Jesus was driving at. The Gnostics thought Jesus was saying to them that if you go inside of yourself and be physician heal thyself and absorb Gnosis, you will cast out the demons. You will balance yourself. You will uh, metaphorically heal the blind or the lame or the sick, and you will be upright and um, so Gnosis for the Gnostic was a healing, rebalancing process. In some ways, as I said, it seems to parallel the Kabbalistic themes that very well could have been alive and practiced around the time that Jesus lived. Because, as I said, when I opened up with this book, when I, uh, however months ago, many months ago, from the time of 200 B.C., from before Jesus was born, to 280, just 200 years after he was born, there's a 400-year period where that whole area flourished with ideas. 
the, the library in Alexandria, uh, the different cultures that were crossing each other and exchanging ideas. Buddhism was in the area. Um, mysticism was in the area. There was an exchange of many, many ideas in the area at the time. So I don't think it's far beyond reason to suspect or even hint at the idea that maybe some of these Kabbalistic themes were present and talked about around the time that Jesus lived. And part of that is this rebalancing himself and striking a balance inside of himself and finding a peace inside of himself. And the Gnostics thought that's what Jesus was driving at. Now, um, a third thing that separates the Gnostics from the Orthodoxy is the Gnostics believed that it was humankind's destiny to become a Christ or son of God as Jesus was. So when Jesus lived and he uh, taught and then he was he was crucified and he died, for the Gnostic, Jesus was laying out a pathway that was previously unopened for humankind to walk towards. He was the model for the individual to walk to. This is why when a Gnostic would hear Jesus say something like, if you would follow me, you must pick up your cross and carry it yourself. A statement like that to a Gnostic would mean Everything that he taught in Gnosis and being able to grow and then being crucified on the cross. And this is where it, it lapses from a historical event into a metaphorical interpretation. The historical event of Jesus' crucifixion was a model for the metaphoric idea that we must crucify ourselves upon beliefs and ideas that keep us out of balance and put us to sleep. As I said, paralleling Zen Buddhism and the idea of annihilation of self or Toltec shamanism and the idea of shamanic death. The idea that key parts of our personality, things that we identify with, things that we think are part of self, sometimes has to die for something new to grow in. For the Gnostics, Jesus' real life example of his death was a metaphor speaking about the experience that every person must have if they are to come awake and open up into the Christ consciousness. The, uh, in particular from where I am in the book now with the Valentinian Gnostics it seems to be that everything that Jesus talked about in that context was pointing in that direction and, and it formed as I said a continuity for the Gnostics, the, the Valentinian Gnostics that were saying okay well then the process is internalized and I can heal myself and I, become, I can become Christ just like you. And as Jesus had said, if you understand my teachings, you will have the same amount of power as I have, if not more. Or Jesus said, is it, right, is it not written? Are you not sons of God? When Jesus made statements like this, again, the Gnostics heard it and said, all right, there's a continuity. He's pointing in that particular direction. Not in the direction of this and, and I'll go into it a little bit more is actually because um, sin is a big part of it too. Sin that has caused us to be inherently flawed, so we need blood to wash away and redemption through grace, but a sin of error, a sin of missing the mark, and a sin that keeps a one in the dark, that if we wake ourselves up and correct the imbalance and seek the gnosis, we will rise to the level of the Christ consciousness and find our way home again. In some ways, it's very easy to see why there was such derision between the orthodox teaching, which was uh, gaining momentum, and these... Gnostic fashion, factions were saying, okay, I know you're saying that Jesus said this particular thing and he meant this particular thing, but we think he means this. So the schism would get more and more and more and more and more. Lastly, as, um, as I said, to the Gnostic, Jesus' life and his ministry and his death was an example of the path that every Gnostic had to walk um, because Jesus had discovered and trailblazed the pathway back to God. Now, the reason why this is interesting, too, is because there are, it's important here to, to, to point out that there are some Christian factions that would argue that Jesus was born wholly intact as an infant. He had no need to learn. He was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. What need would Jesus have for going through a process of gradual gnosis and ultimately to, to lay out that, that, that opus of an example of crucifixion for people to follow after him because it begs the question Jesus the man, Jesus the demigod Jesus the God, did he have to learn, did he learn we've got, you know, because there are some really big questions it begs like from 12 to 30 there's no written record of Jesus in the Bible, you know, there's him talking to the uh, 
him talking to the elders in the temple at 12. <coughs> then it jumps to 30 when he comes out of the desert and he's baptized by John the Baptist. What did he do in those 18 years? And uh, there's something to speculate that he learned and he grew. And um, of course, again, this is, is it, uh, somewhat inflammatory because there are those who would say and argue that he had no need to grow. He was just quietly living in Nazareth with his father doing carpentry work. Nothing was going on. And all of a sudden, like a, a, a switch got flicked. And all of a sudden, he started his ministry at 30. And so there are clearly uh, polemic differences in like saying, what was Jesus' nature? Did he have to learn as a human? Or is he divided? He didn't have to learn. Interesting stuff. So I want to get into the first part of these last sections of these last sections of the Gospel of Philip. Uh, so there's a section called "What is Hidden is Upright," and this kind of goes into that part of um, uh, awaking and healing and rebalancing what was important to a Gnostic. This whole section talks about hidden parts are upright. It talks about the idea, it circles on the idea of um, what is exposed will die and what is covered will not die. And they say something like, one of the examples they use is the intestines. They're invisible, so they're protected. But if they were visible and they were outside, a person would die. And they use this as like a, a metaphor, an allegory for the, uh, uh, the idea, and they also use a tree. If a root of a tree is exposed, it will dry up and die. And... Um, They, but they also use the root for the idea that the root is where wickedness lies, or you know what is the darkness in the root of the person, uh, and, and, is, and when it's laid bare or shown, it dries up and dies, and when it is recognized, it dissolves. When it is revealed, it perishes. This is why the word says, even now the axe lies set against the root of the tree, and again that was uh, Matthew uh, three ten. Uh, section, uh, uh, section 3, verse 10. So when the Gnostics heard Jesus say these particular things, like the axe lies against the root of the tree, it went into the Gnostic theme of when we go into ourselves and we root out the evil, like laying an axe against the root of a tree to cut it out, this is how one heals through Gnosis. You absorb the Gnosis and explore the self, the internalization of the process, and weed out these sections that cause us to diminish, that cause us to sustain the confusion. And... Um, that was part of the process. And again, this continuity, as I had said, Jesus also said, amongst other things, the point towards internalization. And I'm speaking as if I were a Gnostic. He also talks about the idea that the axe is laid against the root of the tree. So he's talking about the idea of cutting out the root of what is evil inside of the person. And only the singular person can do that by going inside of the self. Again, the Gnostic continuity of like, so that's what Jesus meant. So this is what he really means. When I go on to the next section, I want to read the whole thing because, again, this is, it takes two of the, the, the I, I said there was four things that separated, uh, they were clearly uh, Gnostic in their, in their belief, the internalization, the uh, rebalancing and the healing of the person, uh, humankind's destiny, and Jesus' life as a model. The root of the evil actually has at least two of these parts in it. Um, that form around the uh, Gnostic ideation, and it is root of evil. So I'm going to read it here. Jesus pulled out the root of the whole place, while others did it only partially. So that could be a reference to the to the to the saints and the prophets that came before, whether it was whether it was uh, um, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or Elijah, or Moses, all the ones and the, the patriarchs and all the great holy men before Jesus are said to have historically only been partially, success, partially successful in rooting out the evil that is in itself that keeps us away from God. As for us, let each one dig down after the root of evil that is within us and pluck it out of our heart from the root. It will be uprooted if we recognize it. But if we are ignorant of it, take root in us. It produces fruit in our heart. It masters us. And again, when uh, the Gnostics would write under this particular 
this particular theme and this imagery of the idea of the fruits that it, you know the, the root of evil and the idea of a tree and the fruits it bears when Jesus said the thing about you know a tree by the fruit it bears and cursing a fig tree and all the things in his ministry that coupled with going all the way back to the idea of the Garden of Eden and the idea of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the corruptibility that was inherently um imbibed in, in humans when they ate from the tree, what caused them to sin or miss the mark and stay in the fog of ignorance. So again, if we are ignorant of it, it takes root in us and produces fruit in our heart. It masters us. When we are as slaves, it takes us captive to make us do what we do not want and what we do not want, we do not do. It is a powerful because we have recognized it while it exists in its act active so, you know, this covers a lot of different things. For one, Jesus was the model. He was able to root out all the evil from his heart. And where, successfully, where all the ones that came before him weren't able to. And in laying out the groundwork, being that play, a trailblazer, he laid out a way for the Gnostic f to follow after him and do it themselves also, to rise to the Christ-level consciousness. This is what the Gnostics came to, at least the Valentinian Gnostics, came to see everything that Jesus was talking about and, and how it supported these four, what, what seemed to appear to be fundamental tenets of the Gnostic, the Valentinian Gnostic belief system. So the root of evil, another reason why I wanted to bring up the, the whole thing with the, the root of evil and read it was because also what they could infer from what was, you know, um, uh, translated laterally, again, borrowing from or taking from the same interpretation from the New Testament, um, in Matthew 7.13, where Jesus uh, says to enter to, through the narrow gate. Why is the path to hell? And many will try to, but narrow is the gate, uh, and few will enter and find salvation or be able to find a way to heaven. Um, for the Gnostic, this became a pillar of a confirmation, as it were. It became a confirmation that the narrow gate, the narrow gate is only wide enough for one. That one is you. That one is me. The narrow gate is the self. So that was a confirmation that Jesus was talking about an internalization. The Gnostics heard that idea, and they said, well, you know, the, the part about being brought and going to hell would be when you externalize always with the idea of your sacrifice or your ritual or your judgment, which, you know, his ministry is full of him admonishing those who do all the judging. That he is without sin, cast the first stone, giving to Caesar what is owed to Caesar. Do I turn my father's house into a, a, a house of money changers? All these things he was doing because he was pointing out that for all of you who I admonish and whip with the cord are externalizing the process. If you go and follow the narrow gate and go inside an internalization of self, this is the key to being able to, the key to the kingdom of heaven. This is the key to becoming the Christ. This is the key to getting home. That little saying about entering the narrow gate was, again, a confirmation for the Gnostics. Jesus was saying you have to internalize it and you have to heal yourself. So, um, move on to the next section, which is um, ignorance. Now, ignorance is, plays a big part in. Um, is that right? Ignorance plays a big part in the Gnostic belief because ignorance is the root of what has caused us to be away from God. Now. And, and again, it's it's the, the the orthodoxy and the Gnostics play with words that we think are clearly defined, even though you have two groups looking at the same word and have a distinctively different interpretations and definitions for these particular words. And again, what I mean is sin and death. Um, there are at least two. Ignorance, uh, I'm sorry, just uh, kind of like going in a bunch of different directions with it. In this section called Ignorance, um, and, and actually the first line actually says a lot about the premium that they, the premium that the Gnostics put on the idea of ignorance 
and how it must be confronted, and how it's the root of what is causing us to go in a particular direction we go, uh, one goes into when they fall away from God. The first line is, the first two lines actually, ignorance is the mother of all evil. Ignorance will eventuate in death. So, you contrast against the orthodoxy. And the orthodox belief is sin is uh, the ultimate evil. And sin in that evil will eventuate in death, which is going to the place of eternal, uh, eternal suffering or uh, if you're rewarded to the place of eternal pleasure in heaven. The Gnostics... And again, this is that thing of where, for the Orthodox, because when they trace the story back to the Eve from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it became an inherent flaw inside of humans, and what causes them to fall away and need the blood of Jesus to be able to wash away the sin. Ignorance is the mother of all evil to the Gnostic, because ignorance is evil because it keeps the Gnostic in its perpetual state of the fog of fear and terror that was mentioned in previous chapters. <coughs> in the Apocrypha of John in, the, in here, when John is said to be having a conversation with Jesus, and Jesus mentions the idea that it's the ignorance that causes one to be bound in chains and thrown back into the fire. And uh, in the footnote that explains that Jesus was speaking about the idea of reincarnation. It's the ignorance that causes us to continue to stay inside of a cycle, as it were, a cycle of existence that we have not the courage or the wherewithal to move beyond so that we might rise into the Christ consciousness and move back up towards God. And the only cure for this ignorance, which is the root of all evil, is gnosis. When one absorbs gnosis by internalizing the process, we confront this mother of all evil, this thing that leads to a, a death, and we root it out of ourselves, as Jesus had successfully done, holy, where no man before him was able to do before. So when we absorb gnosis and we heal ourselves, we heal the ultimate evil, the ignorance. And sin, again, in its original definition, means to miss the mark. When we absorb the gnosis and we, uh, we eradicate the ignorance, we correct for the missing of the mark and we start to move towards the Christ awareness or the Christ consciousness. Sin is forgiven. Sin is put aside. Sin is put behind because we no longer miss the mark. Again, clearly, not a sin that says we're born inherently flawed, but a sin that says we're missing the mark and we need to correct for it by healing ourselves and moving towards our inheritance, as it were, of becoming the Christ consciousness and moving towards God. So this is very poignant for part of the Gnostic belief system and, and how they conceptualize the idea of ignorance and death and what it does to a person and how Gnosticism would heal a person. And um, I had written out just a couple examples of the conscious comparison just as a reiteration between the Gnostic understanding of what Jesus is teaching in comparison to the Orthodox. For the Gnostic, ignorance is lack of gnosis. This is why it's the mother of all evil. The sin that causes death or staying unawake, because you continue to miss the mark. For the orthodoxy, inherent sin from the fall causes evil which leads to death or being cast into the pit. Both sides play with the meaning of sin and what it leads to. Both offer different solutions to its eradication, and this is true. For the Gnostic, the solution to this is Gnosis. For the Orthodox, the solution to this is the grace of accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Another example. For the Gnostics, the correction of sin or the missing of mark, which leads to, uh, um, sorry, Gnosis corrects for the sin or missing of the mark, which leads to an awakening of our Christ nature. Jesus' ministry and his teaching and crucifixion created a model for the Gnostic to follow. The Orthodox interpretation of his ministry in, in the crucifixion. Jesus' crucifixion and shedding of his blood was an act of grace to redeem all the sinners who were inherently flawed from the fall. Only accepting Jesus as personal Savior could one hope to be saved and go to heaven. And, and uh, actually, interesting enough, because as I said, uh, when we were going over the, the Johannian um, gospel, for the, Orthodox, for, the, uh, for the Gnostics, 
many Gnostics saw the Johannian Gospels, and we're talking about the one where Jesus claims to be God, I am the truth, the light, and the way, I and the Father are one, uh, no one can uh, go to see the Father, see heaven, but through me. For the Gnostics, this is clearly a Gnostic Gospel. And when I first read that in, 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 in uh, this book, I was a little at a loss because I'm like, I couldn't understand why it would be construed as a Gnostic Gospel. And I understood as I went along that this identification with the Christ consciousness means that one is part and parcel or piece of God. So one could claim to be son of God and I and the Father are one. And um, that's why I believe it resonated strongly for the Gnostics when they heard, when they heard this teaching of John. And um, one of them, uh, to point out, in John 8, uh, uh, section 8, verse 32, if you know the truth, the truth will make you free. You know, uh, it's easy to understand why to the Gnostic ear to hear this word, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free, is pointing directly and clearly to the idea of Gnosis, because Gnosis is the truth, and this truth will set you free, and it will heal you. So it's easier, it's easier for me to understand now why the Gnostics saw the Johannian in particular gospel as Gnostic in its, in its basis. I have just a couple more sections to go, and I've got about 20 minutes left, so we should be able to breeze through the rest of this. Um, the strong and the weak, the manifest and the hidden. In the previous show, I brought up the idea of uh, uh, hermeneutics, which is an Alexandrian Gnostic invention of the allegoric way of interpreting scripture. And the reason why I, this is important to bring up is because part of the reason why there was such continuity to <clears throat> to the Gnostic and, and what Jesus was teaching was because of in some ways because of this application of allegoric understanding um, I think I might have time to read the whole thing but you know and just again going into please bear with me as I try to unpack this idea into what it seems to be the Gnostics were thinking the strong and the weak, the manifest and the hidden. Now we have the manifest things of creation. We say the strong are they who are held in high regard, and the obscure are weak who are despised. Contrast the manifest things of truth. They are weak and despised, whereas the things hidden are strong and held in high regard. The mysteries of truth are revealed, through, though in type and image. And this is where the footnote is, where it says about uh, it fitting into the Alexandrian Gnostic invention of hermeneutics the allegoric way of interpreting scripture. The bridal chamber remains hidden. It is the holy of the holies. The veil at first concealed how God controls creation, but when the veil is torn and things inside are revealed, the house will be left desolate, or rather it will be destroyed. But the whole in inferior Godhead will not free fr flee from these places into the holiest of the holies. For it cannot mix with pure light and per perfect f fullness. Rather, it will be under the wings of the cross and under its arms. The ark will be the salvation of the people when the flood water surges over them. And this is a hinting back, going back to the idea of when they mentioned the crucifixion and the flood. In a footnote, the lines reflect on the crucifixion and the great flood. Now, just to key in, in a couple of words in this section um, and, and, and imagery that it's supposed to set up. Uh, the bridal chamber, the holies of holies, Uh, the the temple the the curtain in the temple uh, the wings of the cross under its arms the ark a flood and surge water these particular things uh, facilitate a, a particular kind of imagery in the mind and the imagination of the Gnostics but more importantly they asked when the Rabboni when Jesus was saying these things about the bridegroom and the bride and going into the holies of the holies and laying in the on the bridal bed. What was he talking about? And if he was talking about these particular things, and we know we have to internalize it, what part of myself is the bridal chamber? What part of myself is the holies of holies? What does the curtain tearing in the temple mean to me and my perception? Uh, what is the cross and the fact that Jesus was crucified on it and, and, and mortification mean to my individual process? Um, and how do I apply it to my individual process? The floodwaters, um, 
what do the floodwaters mean to the individual person in their process? The arc, these particular things when you apply an allegoric understanding, allegoric understanding to interpreting scriptures, in a lot of ways becomes very dynamic and alive to the individual Gnostic because they start to say that the rabbi, the teacher, Jesus was putting out these allegoric, an allegoric framework for me to understand the internal workings of myself. So I might know what direction to walk in. Well, I might know what might, might need to be healed because there is much that needs to be healed. I hadn't really touched upon the idea of what is to be healed. But from what I was able to gather from what Jesus talked about and what, say, for instance, the Gnostics seem to interpret and some of the, the finer parts of humanity, as it were, the more nobler parts of what makes us human. These parts that need to be healed inside of the individual person are the parts that cause the division, the parts that see the us and them, the parts that see we can judge others without judging ourselves. Uh, the parts that need to be healed and balanced are the parts that are cruel for the sake of cruelty and indifferent for the sake of um, your own value over another's. Uh, what needs to be healed is when we lack empathy and compassion, when we act patience and love and kindness for, for others. Jesus seemed to be pointing out to the Gnostics that when we internalize the process and we understand the allegory content, them, content to them, we rebalance ourselves, we grow more compassionate, we grow more loving, we grow more patient, we grow more forgiving. When we move into the Christ consciousness through Gnosis or the, the act of Gnosticism, all these things become cultivated and again, uh, allegoric ramification when Jesus was saying about you will know a tree by the fruit it bears. When a person is this self-centered and selfish and glory hungry or money hungry or indifferent to the suffering of others and they have no patience and they have no love, they have no kindness or empathy for others, this is the fruit that they bear. And it's expressed in all of the words and all of their actions. So any person that is uh, go along trying to become enlightened, trying to move towards the Christ consciousness, will recognize this bad fruit when it's expressed by the tree that stands before them. Any person that we meet, myself, you at home, any person that you're going to meet in your walking, waking life. All their words and all their actions are the fruit that they bear of how they see the world. And in many ways, consequentially, what is undone in them. And what is undone in them to a Gnostic is what needs to be balanced and healed cut out at the root as Jesus had modeled and thrown into the fire so that a new tree can grow. The tree of love, the tree of compassion, the tree of patience, the tree of brotherhood and fraternity and fairness. Uh, as my friend Roger on his show would say, um, the sea of glass, he said there was three angels, fairness, equanimity, and justice. And it's how we treat each other. We don't steal from each other. We don't cheat each other. We give our word to each other. We keep our word to each other. Or as in uh, the four agreements within Toltec shamanism, we're impeccable with our word with each other. We make promises to each other when we keep those promises. We never overextend ourselves um, because we want to please people and then invariably have a fail and we let people down. That is an indicator of what is unbalanced or flawed inside of the self. They would make those promises that they knew they couldn't keep. We always do our best when we commit ourselves to do jobs, when we commit ourselves to work or any plan. I mean, when I'm talking professionally, where my job or a person's job is an executive or CEO of a, of a Fortune 500 company, whatever it is, we commit ourselves to do our very best because we're impeccable with our word. So that means that every day, every moment you're in work, you do your very best at that moment to earn your pay, an honest day's work. You cheat no one. You treat everyone fairly and equally. And you show them love, you show them patience, you show them compassion, you be slow to judgment. These are all the things that for the Gnostics, it seems to be, they need to be balanced and healed inside of the person. And um, this was, uh, it seems to be the goal for these Valentinian Gnostics. Um, I'd have to go back again into the Valentinian to get, I'm sorry, the Sathian to get some more of the nuts and bolts, but these are some of the central thrust of what why the, the, the Valentinian Gnostics put such a premium on the idea of this internalization of the process. Because everything that Jesus was talking about 
was leading up to everything that I had just said and what it created in the person from what rises from the Christ consciousness that's inherent inside of every person when we follow this path and process. So um, on to the next section. I still have a few more minutes. I only have two, <laughs> two sections left. And actually, and again, it's using imagery, the secret of the truth. And it's um, largely the idea of what happened when Jesus was crucified. Now, those familiar with the story know that the curtain in the temple had ripped from top to bottom. When the curtain ripped from top to bottom, when Jesus died, uh, there's uh, many interpretations from different factions of the ramifications of allegorically what this means. For the Valentinian Gnostics, the idea, and they said here, the veil was not torn at the top, since it would have been openly open only to those above. Nor was it torn at the bottom, since it would have been revealed only to those below. But it was rent, torn, from top to bottom. Those above open to us who are below, that we may go into the secret of truth. The truth is what is held in high regard, since it is strong. And we shall go in there by means of lowly types and forms of weakness. And lowly types and forms of weakness. As Jesus had said, the meek will inherit the earth. But again, we could go into the definition of what exactly what the term meek means. It doesn't mean cowering and, and, fe and enfeebled and, and weak. Meek is uh, got a very different definition from that. They are lowly when compared with the perfect glory. There is glory that surpasses glory. There is power that surpasses power. Therefore, the perfect things that have opened to us, together with the hidden things of truth, the holy of the holies has been revealed, and the bridal chamber has invited us in. To the Gnostic ear. When the, Jesus in his final act when he was crucified, the curtain was torn from top to bottom. What if it facilitate for all mankind in Gnostic thought? What was hidden from all people, no matter how hard they tried, was now open and revealed by the pathway that Jesus had laid out. Now, when a person internalized the process, it's always laid bare and revealed by the tearing of the curtain and the opening of the holiest of the holies inside of a person. The Gnostic could pursue this wisdom and this truth to rise to the level of Christ consciousness because of what Jesus had done. So the meaning, as soon as Jesus died, the curtain tore. When the curtain tore, now all of mankind could pursue this Gnostic wisdom and move back towards God. This is where their application of this Alexandrian hermeneutics for allegorically understanding the meaning of particular events. The last part that I will read is called The Perfect Light. And uh, I have a few more minutes, so I should be able to get through it, but and it more or less puts a nice little bow on the very last part of the Gospel of Philip. As long as the seed is hidden, wickedness is ineffectual, but it has not yet been removed from the seed, from the midst of the seed of the Holy Spirit. Everyone is a slave of evil, but when the seed is revealed, the perfect light will flow out into everyone. And all those who are in the light will receive the chrism, which is the oil that they talk about being uh, baptized with, oil and water. Then the slaves will be free and the captives ransomed. Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. And that's taken from Matthew 15, 13. Uh, chapter 15, verse 13. Those who are separated will be joined and fulfilled. Everyone who enters the bridal chamber will kindle the light. But it burns just as in marriage, marriage is performed, though they, though they happen at night. The fire burns only at night and is put out. Yet the mysteries of this marriage are perfect, rather in the day and the light. Neither that day nor its light ever sets. If you become an attendant of the bridal chamber, you will receive the light. If you do not receive it while in those places, you cannot receive it in other places. You who receive the light will not be seen nor detained. And no one will be able to to torment you, even while you live in the world. And when you leave the world, you will have already received the truth in the images. The world has become the eternal realm, or the eons. Because the eternal realm is fullness for you, that is the way it is. It is revealed to you alone, but not hidden in the darkness and in the night, but in the perfect day and the holy light. So, kind of just, you know, they, they put a, like a final 
period at the end of the um, at the section of the Gospel of Philip where it's saying that the way this is the way it is it is revealed to you alone because it, it makes sense that if the, if the process is internalized all it, it will all be contingent on you or me or any person who seeks to gnosis I will go far as my heart desires to grow in gnosis to connect back to God again to become the Christ consciousness it's all up to you alone and using again allegoric uh, the allegoric richness. Jesus had said, the, he used the reference of, of the idea of light and darkness a lot. And those in the light can see and those in darkness are in ignorance. This idea that with Jesus dying and, and Jesus is laying the path out for the Gnostic to pursue this wisdom, he said, it says that you will be in uh, you will no longer be hidden in darkness and night, but a perfect day in holy light, no matter where you go. So that means that it, it's a process that when you cultivate the gnosis inside of self, no matter where you walk, there's a diminishing of the darkness or the ignorance that we all experience when, as you walk through the world, expressing our predilections and our prejudices and our leanings and what is undone in us. When we heal ourselves through the gnosis, we walk in a light that is balanced. Uh, one part that kind of jumped out at me about the idea about not being detained or being bothered by others while you walk through life uh, was this uh, a level of unperturbable, being unperturbable. Um, one remains unperturbed. The parallel, interesting parallel I found was in Taoism, where its ultimate maxim was, uh, though the mountain of Tao may crumble before me, my countenance will not change. The mountain of Tao is life itself, and it's all its foibles. The fact that we experience pain and death and suffering and fear and anger and joy and pleasure and light and laughter, all these different things that make up the mountain of Tao, when a person strikes a balance inside of themselves, they will remain unperturbed so that they do not lose the light, as it were, fall out of or slip out of the Christ consciousness again. And... Um, uh, becoming an attendant of the bridal chamber. Uh, again, for the Gnostic, what does the bridal chamber mean? What is it? Where is it inside of me? What is my holies of holies? And when this bridal chamber that I've entered in, in my self-exploration of the internalization of the process, what will happen when I enter this bridal chamber and I, and I am on the bridal bed, as it were, allegorically or metaphorically speaking? All these questions are answered for the Gnostic because uh, through the idea that Gnosis will bring the light of the clear light of day to all these things as you rise up in your levels of awareness into the Christ consciousness. As I said, this puts a little bow on uh, the last part of the Gospel of Philip. It was actually kind of long, but it's very interesting. And um, we're still in the Valentinian Gnostics section Moving out of the Gospel of Philip, and for the next show, I will be doing the Letter to Flora, which is uh, written by someone named, or credited to someone named Ptolemy, who was said to be a, a student of Valentinos. Um, and he wrote it sometime around 160 AD. I'll go into the specifics and the detail of what this letter is and forward sections. Uh, um, I'll try to move faster through the Gospels. I don't want to get bogged down too much and uh, belabor it too much or make it too tedious. But um, for the next episode, I will be going into the next section, the letter to Flora by Ptolemy. I'd like to thank you for joining me for another episode of Nate Sutan. Uh, again, apologizing that JC couldn't be here. I will um, look forward to just, uh, hoping that you'll tune in for next episode. And again, if you have any questions or comments, we do still have a web page, Nate Sutan, uh, which has the graphics for the opening of the show on it, uh, that you, uh, it so you'll be able to recognize it. And if you have any questions or comments or criticism, please leave them. We'd love to hear them. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Nate Sutan. Good night.